Jason Lynn, uh, writers organize, and I understand you had a, a, a role in that, organizing writers to have a better deal, make a living. Yes, I, I uh, organized a few writers to uh, strike against uh, our dear friend Andrew Allen and the CBC, and was successful in getting what we demanded uh, from the CBC, and that inspired us uh, to stick together and create an organization uh, in order to uh, bargain for uh, rates and uh, working conditions and the uh, uh, protection of the intellectual property of the writer. And that was the uh, first uh, organizing of uh, writers and the first strike of writers in Canada. And um, uh, we succeeded then in doing another very, very strange thing and that was getting the performers and writers working in the same union, uh, which gave us an enormous amount of clout. And uh, with that uh, wonderful uh, uh, freedom and uh, backing that, uh, that we had, uh, we were able to get a lot of goodies for, for writers. Uh, some years uh, after we were well organized, uh, I attended a, an international a conference of uh, writers of uh, radio, television, uh, film, uh, that had uh, delegates come from behind the Iron Curtain and from Europe and, and uh, the, uh, well, all over the world, uh, North America too. And uh, we gathered together uh, to discuss uh, the problems of writers and see what we could do in order to improve their lot. And the chatter went on for, uh, for some time and I got impatient and finally threw down my pencil and said, oh, for God's sakes, why are we uh, playing tiddlywinks? Let's address the serious problems of writers. And the most serious of all is freedom for the writer. Let's start fighting for that. Well, you should have seen the faces of the delegates from Russia and the United States. Neither would touch freedom in broadcasting and film with a hundred foot pole. No discussion about that. Leave it alone. You've been called ruthlessly honest. <laughs> Have I? Subjects, well, Andrew yeah. Allen said so. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, that is the attitude of others towards me. Uh, it, it's not uh, uh, my uh, uh, smiling, uh, mellow fellow uh, approach. It just happened that uh, things that I thought I should draw the attention of the populace to uh, was shocking. Uh, because our society uh, suppresses uh, knowledge and experience of many, 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 many things. Uh, but all societies are structured uh, where the privileged protect the very privileged uh, and the poor the struggling and desperate must make do with what's left, if anything. <laughs> and so that's a broad range of being, uh, a broad range of activity uh, that one runs into every day uh, that needs some attention. And the result is, uh, because I, I took the uh, straightforward uh, approach, 
uh, I could hardly uh, deal with any subject without getting into trouble with uh, some people. At, at one time, uh, Frank Willis sent me across the country to do a series called Men at Work. Uh, that included women, of course. And so I went and spent time uh, on farms, on ranches, in prisons, on fishing dories, uh, in logging camps, uh, in factories, uh, you name it. And uh, I gathered material. And I found the best way to gather material is when you go into these uh, work situations, don't just stand there and, uh, and watch and ask questions. Uh, get in there, grab a shovel or a hammer, uh, or jump on logs uh, uh, with a pike pole and help uh, sort logs and, and do all that stuff. Uh, that is the best way uh, to get uh, you know, honest stuff from the uh, working people. Uh, and that's what, that was my approach. And uh, I got uh, a lot of very zingy stuff. <laughs> I, I came back with all my research and uh, started pounding out these scripts. And they went on the air uh, one a week. And from the word go, there were pro protests. And Ernie B Bushnell called me into his office and began calling me into, into his office every week after the show went on the air. And his constant refrain was, Peterson, don't you like anything? <laughs> but I was just uh, uh, presenting uh, the attitudes uh, of the uh, working people working in the goddamnedest, most dangerous, unhealthy, uh, situations. Uh, you know, this was long before there was any uh, fuss about uh, um, bad working conditions and, and so on. Speaking of dangerous working conditions, um, before we get too much into the issue itself, besides how you did treat it, that's good, we've taken care of that, but in the studio, who are some of the key performers, the people you see every day? Um, you don't have to give me a complete list of everyone, but who are some of the folks you'd you might see on a given work, on a given job, um, some of the key performers that people in the street might might be listening to uh, on the mm -hmm. radio when they go home, with popular characters of radio at the time. Tell me when you want to start. Yeah. I guess I've uh, worked with virtually all the uh, uh, performers in Canada of the past, and most of them in the present, uh, because I did so bloody many shows, and uh, thinking back over the years, uh, what a, a wonderful experience it was to work with those uh, creative performers, those devilish performers, uh, those crazy performers, uh, those uh, deft performers, those blundering performers, those god-awful performers, and so on. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I scribbled down a, um, a list, and very quickly uh, it ran off the bottom of the page. Uh, but some of the people that I uh, really love from the, uh, the past and the present, John Draney, Tommy Tweed, Fletcher Markle, Alice Hill, Ruth Springford, John Scott, Claire Draney, Diane Foster, Hedley Rennie, Beth Lockerbie, Bernie and Barbara Braden, Sandra Scott, Bud Knapp, Fre Frank Petty, Frank Perry, Alan King, Alice Mather, Jane Mallett, Earl, well, you know, I could just go on forever. But, uh, I, I also found myself on occasion feeling sorry for the actors uh, in radio, television, <laughs> and on stage, uh, that they had to go to all that bloody work of exploring lousy characters, only half-formed, 
terrible lines, even memorize them and keep them in their head for anywhere from one day to weeks. Uh, we writers sometimes put terrible burdens on them, <laughs> you know, with some of our terrible writing. But they're, uh, you know, uh, so willing to take on the burden, no matter whether it's a pleasure or a, or a pain to them, and, and produce <laughs> a show. And the, the audience gen generally doesn't appreciate what an intense activity it is performing. Uh, it's intense, of course, for the writer and, and a, uh, a sink or swim thing. Uh, but for the performers, uh, you know, day in, day out, uh, all that they have to give uh, in creating a character. And for most actors, it is nerve-wracking. And in radio, it, it was particularly bad in the, in the early days when everything went on live. And uh, when you, if you blew it, you blew it. And I had one show where Ruth Springford uh, thought she had finished her part in the play. She walked out of the studio uh, to walk home. And there was another scene in which he was to appear. <laughs> and John Draney, uh, who is a, a many-voiced actor, uh, he grabbed the script and stepped in and played Ruth Springford playing this <laughs> character. <laughs> she realized <laughs> that, that she had another scene as she was some distance from the CBC and tore back and stepped into the studio as the announcer was signing the show off. <laughs> Um, was, this a, was there camaraderie or competition among these players, by the way? Were they uh, climbing over each other to get the, the jobs? Were they cliquish? What, what was it? There was enormous camaraderie. Uh, we virtually knew everybody else. And we partied together. Uh, and we met together uh, to plot and, and discuss. Uh, and to celebrate, uh, and to groan <laughs> when things went disastrous. Uh, yes, there was competition uh, between actors, of course, and enormous competition between uh, the directors. Enormous competition. Um, but at the same time, uh, they were friendly uh, when they were together, and um, uh, when uh, things got uh, tough, uh, for them, uh, when their uh, uh, freedom uh, was threatened, uh, they uh, joined forces and, uh, and uh, worked together very well. In the early 50s, quite a few Brits uh, started coming over. And there was that uh, famous quote, Oh, to be in England now that England is here, uh, that we've all heard the story of. Um, was this a moment of resentment and uh, or patience or patronizing attitudes from the British? What, what was that? Can you describe that moment? <coughs> well, uh, the, the uh, CBC uh, modeled itself on the BBC, uh, but also uh, borrowed uh, some values uh, from the American broadcasting networks. And uh, when I uh, first uh, went into the CBC, uh, there were a lot of English and Scottish accents among the, the uh, CBC staff and among uh, performers. Um, and, and that uh, became less and less over the years. Uh, until, uh, of course, we eventually uh, captured a very Canadian profile. Uh, in broadcasting. And our actors, since 
uh, they came from all parts of the country uh, to the broadcasting centers here in the East, just in the same way as servicemen uh, and uh, specialists came from all parts of the country to Toronto, Montreal, and Ottawa, so that it was a wonderful mix of Canadians from all parts of the country. And so we would have actors who could give us a Red River Valley accent, uh, who could give us an Ottawa Valley accent, who could give us a Lunenburg accent, and so on. Uh, and, and so the uh, those shows, uh, you know, uh, sparkled uh, like a, uh, a golden crown set with, uh, with jewels because of, uh, of their ability to uh, uh, capture these uh, uh, jewels from all over the country. Um, in search of ourselves, what does it mean to you? What does that mean to me? Can you tell me? Yeah, the CBC... Uh, came into existence at the time that uh, societies all over the world uh, were making discoveries in special fields, uh, such as uh, psychiatry, anthropology, uh, the various sciences, and so on. And we writers were asked uh, to bring to life the values, uh, to put flesh uh, and faces on the discoveries uh, and principles and values in these many fields that were opening up. And so uh, we were asked to write dramas and documentaries uh, for every department of the CBC, uh, for which we would, uh, of course, use actors. And so the kind of drama that we produced was not artsy-fartsy. You know, it, it, it wasn't confined uh, just to uh, uh, the wonderful, playful, uh, la-di-da uh, stuff uh, the uh, drama had up to that point in Canada. Uh, and uh, that influences me uh, right to today. Uh, my dramas bloody well have to be about something, though they do involve interpersonal relations. Uh, you know, that isn't the be-all and end-all. Now, uh, in search of ourselves, I was asked by Marjorie McEnany in the uh, Talks and Public Affairs Department uh, to work with uh, uh, Dr. John Griffin, who was a psychiatrist, uh, to prepare uh, a series of shows about uh, Canadians uh, who were having uh, social, uh, psychiatric problems. And uh, we were to use the uh, uh, the discoveries of uh, Carl Jung and, and uh, Freud and uh, Adler and so on. Um, now, and then you could take uh, one of two approaches uh, to dealing with that. Uh, one was to study the theories uh, that those uh, great uh, psychiatrists had uh, uh, formulated and write something that fitted this, the theory. Or you could take, take the approach of uh, the experience of the psychiatrist who was faced with a human being who had problems that didn't fit any theory, <laughs> but one a doctor might use uh, some of, of his theories in order to uh, deal with the problem. And you could also take the approach of 
taking a, uh, an emotional and, and mental problem, uh, present it, and then solve it at the end. Or you could take the problem, explore it, and in most cases, not solve it, because that's closer to life and the practice <laughs> in psychiatry. Uh, John Griffin and uh, Essie Young, my director, and I all agreed uh, to take the approach of here is an individual, a human being. Let's approach it humanistically. Uh, we will use uh, the discoveries of psychiatry uh, to deal with it uh, and explore it. But we bloody well uh, weren't going to play God and solve every uh, uh, situation and problem. And so we left it open-ended. And uh, uh, following my drama, there was a discussion with psychiatrists, with uh, uh, ordinary people and so on, uh, read the drama and read the situation. Uh, I spent some time in the States with psychiatrists exploring uh, possible approaches to this and uh, was able to con a lot of psychiatrists into thinking I was uh, one of their fellow psychiatrists. <laughs> Uh, but they were very disturbed, and so were broadcasters, uh, that our plan was to leave it open-ended. Uh, as you will notice in uh, uh, broadcasting this in the States generally, in their plotting of dramas and, and, and their discussion of, of, of problems and so on, how they tie it up neat, neatly at the end, so that the uh, viewer or listener uh, goes away feeling smug, Okay, we've got control of that. <laughs> and ours, I think, was the, uh, was the better approach. And uh, the range of, of, uh, of uh, problems, you know, was enormous. And, and that was the, uh, the, the first, uh, the first um, uh, awareness uh, the populace uh, generally had about psychiatry. And then... Uh, uh, I moved into uh, anthropology. Uh, an American uh, anthropologist, uh, uh, he'd heard uh, some of the CBC broadcasts and decided that uh, the CBC would be the, uh, uh, the organization uh, to produce a series illustrating the principles of anthropology. So he came up here and um, got Andrew Allen uh, to produce a series with uh, uh, Lister Sinclair and myself and, and a few other readers. And uh, uh, we dealt with uh, uh, anthropology uh, in societies all over the world. And... Um, it was, it was a very successful uh, series and uh, was uh, recorded and then uh, used in universities uh, uh, with students. And uh, uh, Lister was more inclined uh, to follow the, uh, the principles and uh, be more abstract in presenting uh, uh, his uh, cases. Uh, I, uh, maybe a less gifted person, uh, uh, but m more cussed about um, humanism uh, and concentrating on the on the individual, uh, stuck to uh, uh, doing dramas uh, which dealt with human beings first uh, and with the uh, uh, the patterns of uh, of culture uh, secondly. When I read the early clippings, thank you. When I read the early clippings on you, uh, there's the burlap bag comes up quite often. It's a fine work. What went right there exactly? <laughs> well, <laughs> that was the first, uh, the first drama I wrote after getting out of the army. And 
our heads were full of the war, uh, which followed uh, so closely upon the First World War. Uh, my head was full of terrible incidents. I, I went to visit a, a friend of mine from the army, uh, from infantry, who was um, killed overseas. And his mother, whose husband was gassed in the First World War and eventually died. She had three sons to bring up. My buddy and one of his brothers didn't come back. And the mother received word of my buddy being killed on a Friday and on a Saturday she received word of the second brother and the son being killed. And you know, that's just one incident uh, in hundreds of thousands. Uh, my head was full of the disclosures of the death camps. My head was full of all the nonsense of the uh, totalitarian regimes uh, that were well supported for many years by the democracies. Uh, and I felt very unreal. You know, just, and I can remember being discharged and, and uh, you know, walking from the uh, place where I was discharged along the streets of Toronto. A plane flew over and, and I thought, well, one of theirs or ours, thank God, they're only ours now, and so on. I felt very unreal. And I got a, a room in a rooming house, and what a switch, writing about the war, and then the war being over. What do you write about? And what are your values now? Damned if I knew. And I sat at my desk and I had a pile of, uh, of half uh, ordinary sized uh, full scap that for some reason I'd cut in half, so I made a pile of fairly short pages. And I just uh, sat there musing and the nonsense that I thought, mad, 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 disconnected thoughts. I scribbled down on these pages and scribbled and scribbled and scribbled and scribbled. Uh, nothing was connected to anything else, nothing made sense, but I kept on scribbling. Part of me was mad, part of me was, could still function. And eventually I looked at this pile and I thought, now what in the hell can you do with that? <laughs> and a character formed in my, my mind uh, that was not me but had a lot of me in it, of a guy in a rooming house. Uh, as alienated as I was, uh, who still had a job and went to work, but was alienated in everything he did. And then he noticed everyone around him was putting a burlap bag over his head because he didn't want to see what was going on. But you can see enough through burlap, uh, you know, so you can walk along the street and so on, or even do your job with a burlap bag over you. And so that became uh, the motif uh, and, you know, a good image of where we all were. We all were walking around. Uh, it's time to get under the rescue. You see, 
uh, our society today uh, no longer. Is it, is uh, our society today uh, doesn't want to get involved with connected thought because connected thought leads to reason and reason draws us into areas of examining why things are this way and why they needn't be this way. And uh, my uh, development uh, has been along the line of trying to find out why. Uh, that is the, the Socratic approach, where you ask one question and then another question on, uh, out of the first question and a third question out of that and you only move along uh, a little bit each time but eventually it adds up to an understanding of something. And understanding is a terrifying thing. Uh, understanding means you're getting at reality, you're getting at truth. And our economics and politics are not founded on understanding and truth. Uh, they are founded on fantasy. And they encourage more and more unreality. And eventually you reach the unreality of, the, of totalitarianism. Uh, because uh, certain people get control uh, of our thoughts and, and uh, uh, expressions uh, and limit uh, our discoveries. And eventually, you know, you end up with the disaster that Germany faced, with the disaster that uh, Russia faced, and so on. As I watch the sands of the time running out in this interview, I'd like to ask you about the Jupiter Theater. If you can quickly sum up that story for me, uh, the people involved. Well, uh, uh, Jupiter Theater was, was formed at a time uh, when uh, other uh, uh, theater activity uh, had uh, uh, f fallen in, and there was uh, virtually uh, no activity in the theater at all in, in Toronto. And uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, writers and actors, particularly the actors uh, and directors, were very restless. And uh, so I w one day was uh, reading aloud uh, Albert Camus' uh, Caligula. And the way I read it uh, made it seem very funny to those who were listening. And uh, there was uh, suddenly uh, the enthusiastic reaction Oh Christ, we've got to uh, uh, create a theater to put this thing on. And uh, so uh, Lorne Green, uh, John Draney, and uh, uh, Fletcher Mark, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, Glenn Frankfurter, and so on, uh, decided that we'd uh, f form a theater. And we all put in $100. Uh, and we ended up with a thousand dollars, and we had a uh, a board of ten people, and a uh, a producing a group within the board uh, of four of us who were uh, each one in turn produced a play, and uh, we were interested in the exciting things uh, that were happening uh, in European drama uh, with Camus and with uh, Sartre, uh, with uh, Northrop Frye, uh, and so on. And uh, in other words, uh, we were interested in uh, 
presenting to the Canadians uh, the foremost uh, thrust in drama in the world uh, from Europe, uh, from the st States and from England and so on. Uh, we also wanted to, uh, to do Canadian plays, but uh, there were very, very few uh, writers writing uh, stage plays at that time. And so uh, we started by relying on uh, borrowed uh, vehicles. And uh, uh, these uh, fell into what were described uh, by a lot of uh, uh, mimsies as radical. <laughs> and of course, it, uh, we got into problems. Uh, for instance, we were uh, uh, courageous enough, uh, you know, uh, to do that uh, uh, communist uh, Brecht. Uh, we were uh, courageous enough to do uh, The Biggest Thief in Town, written by Dalton Trumbo, uh, one of the uh, uh, screenwriters of Hollywood, you know, who was uh, condemned during the McCarthy period, and so on. Uh, in other words, we set our own standards, and those were the uh, plays we were going to, uh, to do, come hell or high water. We felt it was necessary for these things to be drawn to the attention of Canadians so that we could begin uh, thinking in a more open way. Uh, so that's what we did. Uh, do, do you want to know of, uh, about the end <laughs> of Jupiter Theatre? Well, uh, we produced for, I think it was three and a half years, and we produced at the Museum Theatre mainly, but we also produced uh, at uh, uh, the uh, Ryerson uh, Theatre. Uh, we produced uh, at the Royal Alec. Uh, we produced uh, at a church and so on. Uh, and we sometimes had uh, two or three productions uh, going at the same time. Uh, we hired uh, the best actors we could, uh, the best directors we could uh, uh, find. Uh, there were very few experienced ones here in Toronto. Uh, so we got directors from England, we got directors uh, from the States, uh, we got directors from Montreal, uh, and we were not disappointed in any of them, they were all great. Um, but we, uh, we still felt we were a little on the timid side when it came to directing, although uh, we thought we were great as, uh, in the acting area. Uh, we were still a little tentative in the, in the writing area, too, for the stage. And uh, uh, when we sent out calls for, uh, for plays, we got very few of you that were uh, playable. Uh, and, and, you know, that's how we, we went in the, to begin with. And at the end of, of, uh, of this uh, three, three and a half year period, we found we were $10,000 in the hole. And we were the first uh, uh, theater of that period to be paying uh, actors and, and designers and so on, directors. But there we were, $10,000 in the hole. Unfortunately, just at that time, Stratford organized the festival there. And when we went around desperately looking for money, everybody said, but we've got Stratford now. We couldn't get a goddamn dime. So we had to close up shop and reach in our own pockets and pay off our $10,000 debt. I've got a funny story to tell about <coughs> uh, a great um, director from uh, England, uh, Michelle. Um, I don't know whether that was that his first name or last name. Well, anyway, 
Yeah, he was a, a renowned director uh, from the old Vic and so on. And he was invited over here uh, to perhaps uh, influence the level of, of drama being produced. And he had a uh, so a meeting was organized uh, with uh, Herb Whitaker uh, representing the uh, uh, the amateur theater world. Uh, there was um, myself and Lauren Green uh, representing Jupiter Theater, and. There was a, a mousy little guy with glasses uh, who proposed the absolutely ridiculous idea of creating a Shakespeare festival in a small town in Ontario called Stratford for no other reason than the goddamn place was called Stratford. And I... <laughs> can remember Lord Green <laughs> and I looking at each other and thinking, oh Christ, there's a, a, a bird brain idea if there ever was one. Well, <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> Did you look up to the level of theater that was going on in Quebec? Yeah, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the one we, we knew most uh, was uh, uh, Gelano and, and his activities. Uh, and then there was a guy by the name of Pierre Dagenot. I don't know whether he's still active or not. Uh, he was doing some great things uh, in, in Quebec. Um, and uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we invited a number of uh, directors from Quebec, uh, both English and, and French, uh, because we felt that they'd had more experience than we. Uh, and they came and delivered uh, uh, great stuff. Uh, uh, people like uh, Roberta Beatty, and so on. Uh, and I, and, and uh, they were very helpful to us. And I can remember uh, when Jeleno and Bernard Hoag uh, brought Teacock to Toronto and played at the Royal Alec. And uh, uh, we uh, uh, did some friendly things to make him feel at home in Toronto. And he was very uneasy about bringing uh, Teacock to Toronto. Those terrible, uh, hostile uh, English. Yeah. And he was astonished, absolutely flabbergasted, to discover how warmly he was embraced and admired in Toronto. And oh God, that all separatists in Quebec could come and visit us in the rest of Canada, could come and visit their own French folk spread across the country and discover what a strong, warm, enthusiastic bond we have with the French of Quebec. Keeping right along, um, Galileo was uh, directed and designed by, you know, Herbie, Herbie Whitaker. Tell me about that. Yeah. Herbie Whitaker was a, uh, a director, designer, and critic. And we had decided uh, to do Galileo. We, you know, we liked the subject and, and, uh, and what it said. Uh, when it was produced in the, in the States, it didn't get a, a, a too good a reaction. Uh, Charles Lawton. Uh, adapted it uh, for an English audience. And at the time uh, we decided to do it, lo and behold, Charles La Lawton was in Toronto uh, playing in the quartet 
uh, at the Royal Alec. And so Herbie Whitaker got in touch with, uh, with Lawton and, and uh, said uh, that we are producing uh, Galileo and uh, we would like very much uh, if he would uh, uh, come and talk to the, uh, to the cast and director uh, for a few minutes uh, and uh, uh, tell us a bit about uh, his work in, in, in adapting it for the English uh, audience. Well, he said, okay, I'll come. So he came at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. And we had the, the cast and all the uh, uh, crew involved and Herbie Whitaker, the director. And we sat around and Charles Lawton began uh, to comment on various characters and various scenes and so on. Uh, but he got so enthusiastic, he ended up playing all the characters and all the scenes throughout the entire play with running <laughs> commentary. It was the most terrific performance in theater <laughs> I have ever <laughs> been involved in. And suddenly somebody looked at his watch and said, my God, it's 6.30. You have to get to the theater. <laughs> Open at eight thirty. <laughs> a cab was called, and he dashed off to the Royal Alley, <laughs> slapped on his makeup, and ran on stage. Uh, you know, what a generous guy, eh? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Giving you all my Oh God. You closed uh, your first season uh, with Crimes of Passion, Lauren Green, Don Heron, and Honor Blackman. Can you tell me about those actors particularly, Green, Heron, Blackman, yeah. how they played it out? It was my opinion for a long time that the performances that Lauren Green gave for Jupiter Theater were better than anything he ever did in the States. And I have heard from others uh, that, John, that uh, Lauren Green said the same thing uh, not long before he died. Because the vehicles we gave him were so marvelous. And the lead uh, in that play of Sartre was one of those uh, great uh, parts that come along rarely for actors. Another one uh, was uh, the lead in The Moneymakers uh, by Ted Allen. Uh, Ted uh, was a, a Canadian uh, a playwright uh, from Montreal uh, who went down to uh, Hollywood and worked there for a while uh, and then got involved in the uh, paranoia in the uh, McCarthy period, came back to Toronto and, and joined our group of, uh, of CBC playwrights. And uh, fortunately, he had a playable play uh, when we were producing uh, called The Money Makers. And it was about a Canadian uh, film writer involved uh, with a monster <laughs> of a Hollywood producer-director. And it was an absolutely wonderful part. And Lauren was uh, ten times life-size in it. And oh, what a delight he was. he was. He was both awful and funny as hell. And <laughs> Ted Allen, uh, the director, uh, thinking he was writing a play uh, championing uh, the playwright uh, who was being roughly treated in Hollywood uh, made uh, the Canadians in the play so Simon Pure uh, 
that they weren't human beings at all, but that wonderful character uh, of the uh, awful producer, uh, you know, <laughs> was so wonderful. Well, uh, uh, we uh, playwrights uh, uh, discover eventually uh, that we get our best characters <laughs> from perhaps the ones we disapprove of most and who are most evil. An early, um, an early greatest moment of Don Heron. Can you tell me? Early greatest moment that you can see the guy was talented, or would you like me to ask another question? Well, I, I remember uh, Don Heron coming out of uh, university, and <clears throat> he was a very, very bright guy and did extremely well scholastically. Uh, and a lot of people thought, uh, you know, that his career should have been uh, more intellectual <laughs> than theater. Uh, but uh, I guess he had certain drives in him that required him uh, to satisfy them as a performer. And uh, for me, and no doubt for uh, uh, for uh, Don Heron, uh, the wonderful thing about theater is that you present uh, to the audience total man. The physical man, the emotional man, the spiritual man, the, the social man, the economic man, and on and on. Uh, and you know, what a wonderful thing to play with. You know, the, the, the number of notes you can play on that is great, or if not greater than uh, what a composer has with the symphony. And that was Don Heron. And... I have to move on. Christopher okay. Plummer, early on, Lady Not for Burning. What was your impression of this young guy? He's a trouble. A lot of people saw him as, ooh, that Plummer guy, but he's good. What was your impression? Oh yeah, well, well uh, Chris Plummer was very, uh, a very bright, uh, very gifted uh, actor. Uh, he was also a good musician. Uh, he was one of those wonderful actors who has charm and exudes evil at the same time. Uh, so that uh, women went for him in a big way. And guys liked him as a, as a man's man. And he had, uh, you know, this, this, this wonderful voice. Uh, who was trained by Eleanor Stewart, uh, who was a, uh, uh, a voice and acting uh, teacher in Montreal. And she developed a, a whole string of, of uh, young actors who went on to um, do great things. Most of them male, by the way. Uh, Plummer turned up here, and uh, uh, we saw him and immediately uh, uh, wanted to use him. Uh, and of course, uh, we used him in, in The Ladies Not For Burning. And uh, for the uh, sets of that show, we had Harold Town. And when you get involved with Harold Town, you got involved. And his sets and uh, costumes virtually took over <laughs> the show. Uh, you know, they were that uh, uh, grand and, and, and startling and, and eye-catching. Uh, I know that um, uh, Plummer and Harold Town uh, uh, nearly came to blows, uh, you know, because of uh, uh, Plummer wanting his costume a little differently. and. Uh, but but no one criticized Harold Town. <laughs> Harold Town could be uh, pretty rough and ready. I remember one time Harold seeing uh, some guy snatch a woman's purse uh, down on the street, and he was in the second uh, floor of uh, of his building, and he dashed down and tore after the guy and got the purse back. That's the kind of guy he was. Well, Nathan Cohen was a director, or at least a critic, uh, who also had um, uh, ambitions as a uh, playwright. 
and uh, uh, he brought us a play which uh, we thought uh, uh, was producible, but we felt, uh, well, you know, you could uh, do some things to it to fix it up. And um, the, the, um, the producer of that show, we, we gave it to our uh, general manager to, uh, to produce because he'd been bugging us for a long time. He wanted to produce a show. Uh, so we said, okay, you can do the Cohen thing. Uh, get him to make uh, these changes and, and, or come and have him come and see us and we'll discuss it. Uh, Nathan was, uh, and, and we kept bugging him, give us the goddamn script so we can look at it. And we had uh, gotten a director and a lead star man uh, from New York for his play. Uh, we kept bugging for, uh, uh, to see the play, and uh, the producer kept saying, oh, uh, uh, Nathan's working on it, and it's coming along great, uh, but no script. We finally received the script uh, the evening that the uh, director and star turned up in Toronto. And I quickly read it and, and thought, oh, there's a problem here. Uh, everything seems to hang in the air and isn't motivated or connected to anything else. We really got to do something with this. I, I gave it to the other directors to uh, quickly look over, and they were of the same opinion. Uh, so what do we do? Cancel it and pay for the, uh, uh, the, the theater and uh, uh, performers' time? They sit around while this play gets um, uh, fixed? Or do we roll with it as is? And uh, we sat in a car, in the, uh, that is the director sat in the car, uh, behind the museum theater uh, from about nine o'clock one night until about four in the morning discussing what, you know, what we could do. And we finally decided uh, we'd have to roll with it. So we did. And no changes were made even during rehearsals. And it went on. And uh, Lister Sinclair uh, reviewed it for uh, CBC. Uh, uh, Nathan Cohen was a director, uh, or at least a critic for the CBC, and he expected uh, to, to uh, uh, do the uh, critique of his own play because <laughs> he was a regular <laughs> critic. CBC said, no, Nathan. We we'll get somebody else. So they got Lister. And uh, Nathan Cohen had, had hammered uh, one of Lister's plays. <laughs> so uh, Lister uh, had a certain uh, attitude even before he saw the play. Anyway, after seeing it, uh, he was to, the, the review was to go on the air uh, the next morning. Uh, so we all gathered at, uh, I think it was uh, John Draney's house, uh, to listen to the review of the play. Uh, and our uh, winnings or losses depend upon getting a good review. So uh, Lister started, and his first sentence was, Jupiter Theater uh, produced uh, last night uh, premiere performance of uh, Nathan Cohn's play, Blue is for Morning, and uh, he tells us this is the uh, first of a trilogy. Let us hope he will not carry out that threat. So, of course, we had a disaster on our hands, <laughs> lost a lot of money. Possibly.